Great, thank you very much. Um, I am going to attempt to do the whole screen share thing. Uh, I will do a caveat if I am not a tech wizard in the slightest, so it's always a, a bit of an adventure, um, but uh, hopefully it all goes as planned. Uh, all right, so let's go to oops, the beginning. So first off, thank you to, to uh, everyone on the New Directions uh, team for, for inviting me to do this. It's been a lot of fun um, sort of digging through, through past memories and, and traveling through the world of nostalgia. Um, the title, it obviously gives a, a good idea of what I'm going to be talking about, um, but it kind of works in two ways. One, um, I have actually ridden through parts of the ancient world. As you can see in this opening photo, this was taken in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I have this weird thing about wanting to visit all of the Central Asian countries and ride there. One, because very important part of my research, but also they are just spectacularly beautiful, uh, vibrant places to visit. Uh, but also in figuring out sort of what role the horse did play in the ancient world. Um, and and sort of ancient equestrianism and horsemanship and care and, and all of that. So um, I'm just going to give you a, basically today a, a quick gallop through um, some of the things that I've explored in the course of my research, but also how I ended up doing this kind of research because it's a bit unorthodox and it's certainly not what I had uh, planned when I entered my post-secondary um, education experience. So. Uh, first off, probably not going to come as a surprise that I have a uh, a long-standing history with horses. I suppose you could say I have a pre-existing condition when it comes to horses. Um, no idea why, by the way. I don't come from a, a, a horsey family, did not grow up on a farm, grew up in the suburbs of sort of the GTA in Ontario. Uh, apparently from a very young age, I had a thing for horses, as can be seen from my, my little rocking horse photo at my Bop Shun Judge's place. Um, and uh, from there actually moved to the, to the real thing. My parents probably still regret their decision to give me a package of riding lessons as a 10th birthday present because I haven't looked back since then. Uh, fortunately, my parents were wise enough to recognize that purchasing a horse uh, remains a money pit, as it was in the ancient world, as uh, as the character Strepsiades uh, figures out in Aristophanes' Clouds with his son who's driven him into to deep debt uh, through purchasing racehorses. So this actually gave me a really interesting sort of foundation for my uh, unexpected research, because as I grew into my teenage years and, and early 20s, um, I sort of rode whatever horses were offered to me. So, so I saw them all sorts of different animals. Um, and my background is predominantly, up until now, has predominantly been in the English world. So a pretty standard, you know, hunter, jumper, dressage, eventing. There was nothing about my, my early sort of uh, involvement with horses that suggested I would end up shooting bows and riding across Mongolia and doing all sorts of the strange and, and wacky things I do with horses now. So how did I get there? Well, when I moved to Calgary in 2004 for grad school, uh, I came out here, I, so I studied classics at the University of Guelph, didn't write about horses at all, didn't even consider it. Um, I think I wrote two papers, one for a sport, uh, ancient sport class and one for a philosophy class on the ethics of horse racing, but never occurred to me that I could actually do my grad work on anything to do with horses because I wasn't studying science. So I moved out to Calgary. I was going to study the religious propaganda of Alexander the Great for my master's. My supervisor, Waldemar Heckel, was like, no, I don't like that topic and he suggested horses. And of course, I was cognizant of the fact that horses were ever present in the ancient world, that they were really important, that, you know, this is pre-mechanization, and so, you know, horses are used in warfare, and I knew about some sports that used horses, and, and we see them in art, but until I sort of stumbled completely accidentally into this topic, I didn't realize just how present they were. And when you sort of start to look for them, you do find them everywhere. They are on every artistic medium. Uh, you find them in every genre of literature. Um, certainly in the Greek world, you get references to the words for horse in people's names because the horse is a massive marker of, of status and distinction and wealth and power. So I started tracking um, kind of the appearance of horses in, in the ancient world. And, and I don't just talk about Greece and Rome here, you know, whether you're looking at basically across the Eurasian world, horses proliferate in both the artistic and the literary records. So I would go into museums, and this was especially for my PhD when I was starting to, to try 
in um, create sort of um, ways of determining horse types. So looking at features and, and trying to determine what types of horses are, are, are appearing in different parts of the ancient world. So I go into these museums, be like, okay, I have to photograph every horse, every ancient horse in this museum. As I just said, they are everywhere. Uh, so I had more than one museum meltdown. Uh, this one was in Istanbul in the Archaeological Museum in Istanbul, which is spectacular, deceptively large. Um, the cafeteria for some reason was closed, I think for renovations. So I'd been slogging through this museum, taking all of these photos of, of spectacular horse related artifacts or artifacts with horses on them. And the hangar monster hit when I get hungry, the world basically ends. So we're in the basement, we're close to the end. I can like sense the food awaiting outside the museum. And my friend comes running down the ha hallway with like this sadistic gleeful look on his face um, because he had just found the Thracian horse cult room. And so this is me silently beating my head against the door frame before going in and photographing a room full of spectacular uh, equestrian related pieces. So, I fell into this world of studying horses and, and my first approach was to look at warfare. That was what Waldemar had suggested for my, for my masters. Hey, why don't you look at, at the Macedonian cavalry? Because, hey, they're really important and, and you know, played a big role in Alexander's conquests. So as I started to read about cavalry, um, the first thing that came to mind and, and the question I kept circling back to is, who on earth thought that this was a good idea? Because the thing about horses, bless them, is they're afraid of pretty much everything. And I know that there are horse people in the audience and they are 100% gonna relate to a lot of these memes. Um, I have, and I'm not making this up, it has happened to me on more than one occasion, had a horse run away from the sound of their own fart. Like they fart and then they buck and rear and squeal and snort and bolt down the road or the side of the arena or the field or wherever I happen to be, which doesn't really lend itself to thinking, ah, oh, yes, this is an animal we should ride to war. Um, and the, the meme in the middle uh, talking about impulsion, that's the energy that's created by the horse's movement. Uh, and again, um, most people who've, who've worked with horses probably have a similar story of the deadly horse eating corner of your arena, where it doesn't matter how many times you've gone past it, it's going to kill your horse. You know, you can ride past it 20 times, 21st time, it's death and destruction full of hobgoblins. Or going to the left, it's fine, but going to the right, the world is going to end. And clearly we as humans cannot see whatever the terrifying, dangerous thing is. Um, so now I'm going to try, and hopefully this works, there is a magical TikTok video I want to show. Um, so, so I hope it comes across. It's just a um, a few oh, moments. Hell no. Nope, nope, no, 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 no. Oh my god, what is that doing there? I've never seen it before. Is it moving? Is it coming at me? Is it a rabbit? Is it a monster? I don't know. Rabbits are monsters. Is it a bird? I don't know. Birds are monsters. Is it a lie? Is the whole world a lie? Am I even a horse? What is it doing there? I swear it's not supposed to be there. Do you think I could eat it? Is it edible? Maybe I should taste it? No, it's not supposed to be there. Um, so hopefully that worked. Uh, and it just gives you an idea. I mean, that is not staged uh, at all. That is 100% an experienced show horse having a meltdown about flower pots, which again happens more frequently than you would think. So I got to thinking, okay, how did we do it, right? How, why did we think it was a good idea to take this really spooky animal to war? Because the thing about horses and, and the reason why they're so reactive is they're evolution. It's their biology. It's their hardwired behavior. I mean, you know, the horse that we know today, Equus cobalis, has, has evolved over a very, very, very long period of time to be an animal adapted to living in a herd. So they're social, and that's important. We're going to come back to that. Uh, a social animal that lives in groups on wide open grassland spaces. So, you know, being stealthy and tiny and solitary isn't going to help them out. So everything about equine physiology and behavior, their cardiovascular systems, their skeletal systems, their vision, their hearing, um, and, and their whole sense of moving and existing has been created for one purpose, to really be able to run faster and farther than anything that might want to eat them. And you know, when a herd of horses, when they when they sense danger, they don't have like a little conference where the whole herd comes together and they go, okay, so there seems to be some wolves over there. Uh, not sure how hungry they are. Like, should we see how distended their bellies are? What do you think? Let's take a vote, have some working groups. They just run. And, and oftentimes one horse starts to run and the rest automatically 
follow them. There's no, there's no logic, you know, let's, let's problem solve this. It's run away because that is how they survive. So when you think of horses as being a, a very aware, reactive flight animal, this notion of the war horse starts to seem utterly absurd, yet we know it worked because we did it for thousands of years and it kind of revolutionized war. I mean, as Xenophon says in his, his analysis, you know, if, if you go to war without horses and you're fighting someone with cavalry, if they lose, you can't catch them because they can, they can flee on horseback. And if you lose, you can't get away because they're on horses and you aren't. So it becomes this really important thing to have horses in your, within your sort of armed forces. And we even know, um, there's, there's a famous case from China, which I'd be happy to talk about uh, in the Q&A period, of battles that were fought to acquire particular types of horses to, to create uh, a, a strong cavalry. So when we look at some of these examples, and, and there, are, there are loads of, of really magnificent examples of battle that come from, from ancient art, where even in the, the static medium of these pieces, you can sense the, the frenetic energy, the chaos, the, the power, the tension, at times the, the panic and fear that all come through in battle, whether we're looking at the Alexander sarcophagus or the Alexander mosaic. And, and I love the Alexander mosaic because you look at some of the horses, especially the Persian horses, because they are on the losing side, and they're looking pretty concerned about their life choices at that point in time. But Alexander on his horse, like his horse is like, yeah, we got this. And I know I'm anthropomorphizing here, but you're kind of getting that sense of calm or control coming from one side and then sort of the frantic panic from the other. Um, the Portonaccio sarcophagus, often these really elaborate Roman sarcophagi with battle scenes. I mean, they do this, the, this one image doesn't really do it justice. I mean, there's so much going on. You can literally almost feel the energy coming off of the piece. And the same thing with the Assyrian example from the Battle of, of Tiltuba, right? You have the one horse that, that is falling. And, um, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I certainly don't like to think about the fact that, of course, horses were killed in war. Uh, we know this, I mean, throughout history, uh, but it is a reality of that. And that reality does still come through in the art um, and the literature. So really with my master's, the first question, and this went into my PhD, the question I wanted to answer was how did we do it? Um, how did we get these, these fight animals to allow us to ride them to war? And it's not because they were beaten into doing it. I mean, you know, we often, I think there's sometimes a tendency to look back to the ancient world, be like, oh, they just forced horses. They used horrific equipment. And yes, they did have some rather alarming looking bits that they would put in their horses' mouths, but they, they forced them into it and they beat them and punished them. But if you read Xenophon's Art of Horsemanship, um, I mean, he's not, a, you know, full on, you know, don't ever punish your horse. He does agree that there are times to use punishment and to push them. But by and large, it's about understanding the type of horse you have. He talks about horses that are really sensitive, horses that are maybe a bit, a bit duller and slower and sort of the ideal horse and the idea of understanding kind of how your horse is behaving and, and how to introduce them to things as a flight animal to prepare them for this. Uh, and what I actually really found when I started working with horses, because I, I did have that opportunity, and, and I'll talk about this a bit more, to actually start training war horses, uh, is the power of the herd, right? So as a herd animal, herds have strict hierarchies, horses have specific roles within the herd. So in a, in a wild setting, horses form two types of herds, uh, the harem band, which is basically what it sounds like. It's uh, the stallion, so the male horse and his mares and their offspring, and then the bachelor band, also what it sounds like. It's all of the male horses, whether young or older, who haven't got their own harem band. So they're driven to be in a community. So there is this hierarchy. Some horses within that herd are gonna be more dominant. Some are gonna be more submissive. Some are gonna be kind of neutral in between. So when it comes to actually training horses, especially looking at the classical world, where we know they rode in different types of formations, it's the herd that really comes into play because all of these formations, whether, you know, a wedge or a rhomboid, they always have a point to them. So, you know, as a general or as, as, as a leader of that particular section, what you do is you, you understand the horses and riders within your unit and you place them accordingly. So you have the more dominant horses at the front and the more submissive horses at the back. And if you think I'm like, oh, you know, Carolyn, they, they clearly, they, you're really going deep into this horse psychology. We also have lots of stories that reference an understanding of horse behavior, including the very famous story of the taming of Bucephalus uh, that's related by Plutarch. 
and we see it in the art too. These these cute or these these evocative moments where you see horses kind of doing horsey things. So we have a relief of Marcus Curtius, who's this is a really famous Roman myth where Curtius flings himself into an abyss to close it, and and you know it turns into a lake, um, which is what he's doing here. But his horse is tripping. Horses trip. This is what they look like when they trip. It's a horrific feeling when you're sitting on them. Uh, a relief from the Parthenon frieze, where, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about what's going on here, but the horse is just in the background scratching its nose. Uh, we have an Assyrian relief from Asher Banibal's camp, where we actually see a groom brushing down the horse at the end of the day, using like a wooden instrument, which they still use something similar in Central Asia. And then I love this scene of horses being swum across a river. Horses swim quite well, but you don't get a lot of representations of it in, in the art. So you see these snapshots that show an understanding of what horses are and how they behave. Which then led me to actually figure out what is it, how do we train this? You know, I got sick of hearing, oh, you, oh, they couldn't do this on a horse and they couldn't do that on a horse. So that doesn't make sense. So this doesn't make sense. And I kind of threw away my traditional background and, and through many fortuitous encounters. Uh, as a master's student, I met uh, two undergraduate students, uh, Ryan Jones, and Alison Mercer at the University of Calgary, who kind of introduced me to the world of living history and sword fighting and archery and all of that. Uh, and then I met Radar Goddard, who's actually been quite formative in my whole process. She runs a jousting uh, group just outside Calgary, and she has a farm full of basically war horses and training. So I've gone from the show ring to shooting bows, randomly standing up on horses, uh, playing Buzkashi with Matilda the stuffed sheep, uh, riding medieval games, wearing full-on medieval dresses in some of the in one of the world's largest parade and trying not to die, galloping around in reproductions of Roman saddles, um, and really just getting into it, right? Trying to figure out how they did it, how it worked, and how the horse itself, you know, played into the training and use and, and the representations in society. Which has also taken me to some pretty cool places. Um, so as I moved into my PhD, I also became interested in, in the types of horses and how um, different horse types, body types, are, are emerged in different parts of the ancient world as a result of environmental conditions and how this then influenced their use, particularly in battle. So uh, I've, I visited Greece and Turkey. Here I am in Turkey. This is um, in uh, the town of Iznik, so ancient Nicaea, actually riding down a Roman ro road. So that was pretty cool. Uh, I spent a few weeks riding in Mongolia, uh, in Kyrgyzstan. I got to go hang out at some, some stud farms in Tunisia and study the, the barb horse, the North African barb. And of course, even here in Alberta, we have some pretty spectacular riding opportunities. And, and I'm riding a, a half wild, a wildy, or the descendant of a wildy here. Um, but there are feral horses or wild horses that we have here in Alberta. So going and actually riding these horses and figuring out how they're adapted to, to ways in which they were used and their environments. And it has totally blown all my preconceived, you know, uh, English riding school ideas about horses out of the water. Uh, also, you'll notice these horses are all really small. One of my biggest bugbears is the way horses are represented in Hollywood depictions of the ancient world. There's always a Frisian. That's this black horse. They're beautiful. They're big. They've got the furry legs. They're, they, they have a presence. They did not exist in the ancient world. Alexander the Great did not write a Frisian. The latest Mulan movie has Frisians in it. They did not have Frisians in, in China and, and Central Asia. Uh, you also get these Spanish horses, the Iberian horses. They're always the gray white colored ones, the Andalusians and Lusitanos. In reality, ancient horses were small, and this is something that I've sort of forced into people uh, at a lot of conferences. And, and again, I can talk more about this during the Q&A if you want to know why the small size is so important. Um, also, myth busting. So I did a lot of work and realized I didn't have a lot of videos of it, uh, sort of demystifying the fact that, yeah, you can do pretty much everything on a horse bareback that you can do with a saddle, uh, because, of course, in the ancient world, they would have ridden predominantly bareback. Um, but I've been utterly blown away by what some of these horses can do that I've ridden around the world. So the bottom sort of swampy photo that's in Mongolia, that crazy rutted ground, those horses galloped across it. They just did. They just gallop all the time. Mongolian horses are incredibly tough endurance animals. I mean, our horses, I'd be like, my horse would break his ankle, even trying to walk across that. And these horses just went. And they would run for miles and miles every day. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, I mean, we were summiting three and a half thousand, four thousand meter peaks on these tough little horses, which gave a whole new perspective to things like Alexander's campaigns and logistics of getting cavalry and pack horses and animals over these 
you know, pretty insane mountain passes and, and ranges that he would have had to cross. It is doable. They can still do it. And even here in Alberta, um, I, I rode some horses in the backcountry last summer during the pandemic. And the things that these trained horses were able to slither up and down without batting an eyelid, utterly incredible. So it, it brings the, the history to life in a very tangible way. And of course, being able to interact with cultures in Central Asia has been, and Mongolia has been utterly fascinating for this because of course we don't have, I mean, when it comes to trying to understand the ancient steppe cultures, their oral traditions. So a lot of what we have is either archeological finds from burials or outside impressions of them in, in authors like Herodotus and, and, and Strabo and, and so on and so forth. Um, so traveling through, through that part of the world, through the steppe, those texts again come to life. Uh, Strabo refers to the Scythians as mare's milk drinkers, um, and they still drink mare's milk in Central Asia. It's a staple of their diet uh, because it's really high in vitamin C, and as nomads, they don't have a lot of fruits and veggies. Um, so you drink it, it's, it's called arag or kumis. It is actually alcoholic. It's about 5%. Uh, so here we see, there's a photo of my partner and I uh, drinking some, some uh, kumis in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, he looks rightly concerned because um, it can, if your body is not a it's not pasteurized and it's not refrigerated, uh, so it can do some interesting things to your digestive system. I really like it, but it, it is an acquired taste. Um, the kids, I mean, you see why these nomads had such a, you know, the Scythians and Parthians and such had such a formidable reputation as, as, as riders because they're literally doing it from childhood. The, the other bottom photo is from Mongolia and this young kid, probably two or three, who's literally been tied onto the horse and then his older sibling is just dragging him across the steppe. You know, and by the time they're six or seven, they're riding bareback in, in the Natam races, which are, you know, 15 to 30 kilometers long. And the fact that horses are everywhere. They ride horses to their festivals. You know, they put on, I saw a woman at a, a Natam festival on her horse and she was in her best, like her pearls, her dress, her heels, and on her horse. Um, so again, it just, it brings the past to life in, and again, that sounds kind of cheesy, but things you read, things you see in the art all of a sudden start to really make sense. Uh, and very quickly, uh, also sports. Um, this is something I'm, I'm looking at now, is also looking at the tradition of um, uh, horse sports in different parts of the world. Uh, certainly horse sports were incredibly popular in Greece and Rome, particularly the chariot racing and, and the flat racing. Um, and, uh, and again, I can talk more about this during the Q&A. But again, what I'm finding is so basically everywhere that I've traveled uh, that has a horse culture, a horse tradition, they also have their own versions of sports. Um, so the Raven races in Turkey, which are, are tri they're pacing races, they're for gated horses. The Nadam races in Mongolia, and here again, you see the, the kid in front is bareback, barefoot. He's galloped anywhere between 15 to 30 kilometers at this point in time, and uh, he's just flying along. Uh, Kokboru or Buzkashi, uh, which is um, a fascinating kind of version of like polo meets rugby meets I don't know what with a goat carcass. Uh, it's a game I'm actually quite fascinated by and have done some research on. And even I was in, in Plovdiv in Bulgaria, uh, ancient Philippopolis, just wandering through the streets and there was a poster advertising an upcoming um, show jumping competition. So uh, horses are quite literally everywhere um, and especially where you see these, these horse cultures and these horse traditions. So we'll finish up there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I do want to say, you know, I, I'm grateful I fell into this research, even if accidentally it's given me some phenomenal opportunities, as I said, uh, sending me around the world. I've been able to work on some really cool educational outreach programs uh, here in Calgary with Spruce Meadows, but also down in Houston with Archaeology Now, again, talking about the horse culture and kind of the interconnectivity of it all. So I will finish up there and I'm um, happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for that. Uh, yeah, a really great talk. And I like the way you know, interwoven, um, as we were talking about before the, the conversation started, autobiography, um, research, scholarship, uh, learning, and, and sort of giving a different view to how um, we come to some of these topics and how we can learn a little more. So uh, to the audience, just a reminder, there's a Q&A button at the bottom, so you can uh, certainly begin to submit questions there. And, and while you're doing that, I might uh, indulge in the, the host's prerogative to ask a couple of questions of my own. Um, <clears throat> so I was struck, like I, I already said, that this sort of um, experiential or experimental aspect to your work, and I... I, I liked how you said it's a sort of new twist on field work because it made me think that we in, in classics and ancient history often think of the kind of the only thing that you can do with students outside of the classroom is archaeological field work. 
Um, and yet you've obviously shown us this uh, other way to kind of gain access to or, 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 or gain access to a different type of knowledge. So I wondered um, if you found, you know, aside from, you know, as you, as you mentioned, traveling and encountering these different um, games and sports and, and horse breeds and horse cultures, have you found that kind of getting out of the, the classroom, getting out of North America as well, um, getting out of the Anglosphere, um, has sort of helped you kind of maybe decenter yourself as an academic when it comes to this sort of work and and kind of get privilege other aspects that there are other perspectives I should say that aren't necessarily always found at least in the North American Academy. Oh, a hundred percent. You know that you know I, I I mean I started by writing writing in Greece. That was the first sort of writing type research that I did. Uh, Mongolia was was the first big outside of the classical sphere, and yeah, it was. Um, it, it, slightly, I mean, the, I was excited. I'd wanted to go there for ages, but it is kind of this, you know, it's it's outside of the the, the historical world that I'm really familiar with, and so I guess it was a bit of a, a leap of, of faith. Um, but it's been incredible because, of course, the one of the things, and, and I and I often you know talk about this when when I when I talk about why the horse is so important. Um, one of the things that's been so extraordinary through all of this, you know, field work or an experiential stuff whatever you want to call it, is, you know, some of the places where I have traveled to um, have different belief systems, social structures, gender roles. Uh, and of course, uh, as a female, that those are things you're cognizant of. And of course, as a foreign female, the rules don't always apply to me quite the same way. Um, but what I found everywhere I've gone is the horse breaks down those barriers. So whether I am, you know, sitting in a yurt with a bunch of Kyrgyz nomads or uh, chatting with some 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 Ravan jockeys in Turkey or you know hanging out you know just riding through olive groves in Greece and things like that you know all you have to do is show them a picture of your horse right all of a sudden it's like oh, okay you know maybe we don't maybe we speak through an interpreter um maybe you know we eat different cuisine or we have we dress differently or, or or things like that and hey maybe you're a woman who apparently isn't very good at cooking and doing the domestic stuff but oh horses and and it's like I don't want to romanticize it but every time I've gone through this it's like those barriers just poof um and so yes it 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 brings you it brings the culture to life but it does it takes you outside of sort of the strictures of the traditional classical world and you start to realize how connected everything is and then teaching in gen ed that's something i've had to do as well because i have to use texts and materials from um across time periods in western and non-western traditions and so my research has actually really played well into that because i've already sort of gotten used to stepping outside the, the traditional North American Academy and be like, yeah, there's a lot we can learn from these different ways of thinking and being and recording memories and the past and stuff like that. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. I'm just going to indulge myself in one further question. It's a little more specific and it, I'm being really self-indulgent because it reflects my own interest in ancient Greek sport. But uh, I was struck by, you know, your phrase fear of farts, which I think we missed an opportunity for a, a title for today's talk there, but that's for different, different story. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, you said this, the horse and, and the, the, the TikTok made it clear is so afraid of everything. And I wondered, you know, there's, the, of course, as you're aware, that idea in the uh, Hippodrome at Olympia, where the ancient equestrian races happened, that there's Tarek Sipos, the horse frightener at the one end of it, uh, that we're told is this um, thing that somehow frightened horses. And so I, I, I'm gonna, I, I would like to know, what, what do you think of Tarek Sipos? What is it? Uh, and, and what do you think about this idea that there'd be a purposeful thing to frighten horses in a, in a, a context where you've said we need the horses to actually be trained to not be frightened? So yeah, it's, I, I've long wondered around that, about that too. And, um, you know, I kind of equate it to the kill, to the horse eating corner of the arena where, um, you know, there's something that sometimes sets a horse off, right? You know, it, it could be the, the light glinting off something, shadows, you know, something distracts them and they spook at it, which then causes other horses to spook as well. And I think a lot of it also becomes um, psychological with either the rider or the charioteer as well, because then you get this idea in your head that that end of the hippodrome, it's scary and my horses, my team is going to spook at it. And horses are very, very intuitive because they're, they're prey animals. They're very intuitive when it comes to picking up on body language and tension. Right? So even the charioteer, if he starts to clench his hands and sort of hold his breath and get a bit rigid in the chariot as they get closer to that corner, the horses are going to pick up on it and start to go, whoa, what it, 
hey, it's danger. It's like this big red flag, danger, danger, danger. And so I think it's probably, yes, there is something about that corner of, of the Hippodrome that could become spooky at times, whether it's a smell, a sound, the appearance of something, but then it becomes very psychosomatic with the charioteers and the jockeys where they almost reinforce it through their own um, fear of their, their team spooking there and ending up in a wreck. Now, what a great example of also the, the sort of the sort of insight that you can bring from your own experience with horses that someone like myself who's never sat on a horse could never possibly know. So thank you. Okay, well, with that, I'm going to bring it over to the questions because I see there's a bunch of questions in our Q&A window. So I'll, uh, I'll read them out and I'll, uh, I'll attempt to read the attendees' names. So I apologize if I pronounce names incorrectly. But our first one's from anonymous attendees. So it's actually quite easy for me to pronounce. Uh, given the horse's ubiquity, what does it say when the horse is lacking in the archaeological record or artistic record from a particular place in time? So that is actually really interesting. You know, I've really thought about it because everywhere that I've looked, I have found them everywhere. Um, but I would say if there is an absence, if the horse is, is, is absent, it could mean that it hasn't worked its way into that culture or that, that region uh, yet. So, I mean, when we, if we go back to the domestication of, of the horse, you know, five and a half-ish thousand years ago, um, there is debate about where exactly it happened, likely probably somewhere in Central Asia, but I know there are people who would argue against that. Um, there really weren't a lot of horses left. So the horse actually spread through domestication and, and people have, have said that, you know, if we hadn't domesticated them, they may very well have gone extinct. So um, basically we, we domesticate them in one part, they become super useful for travel, for war. They weren't used for agriculture, by the way, that's, a, that's more of a, a medieval thing that comes along later. Um, so they spread particularly through warfare and, and trade. Um, and then one of the things that's so fascinating about the horses, they then find ways to sort of weave their way into pre-existing traditions. So, you know, my thought would be if they're, if we aren't seeing them in the records, um, that they're just really not there yet. Uh, and then, you know, it, but then I would be like, okay, well, let's go look at later periods and see if they then pop up at that point. Um, because most examples of, of cultural traditions I've looked at from the ancient world and later, once the horse arrives, it's like, boom, this animal's amazing. We, and that's, that's very, we see that a lot with um, the First Nations traditions here, of course, in North America as well, when the horse was, came over with, with the, the, the colonials, um, they very quickly incorporated the horse into their traditions. So if it's not there, it's not in the record, my guess would be it's not really that present in society yet. Great. Our next question is from our friend David McMaster from Thornlow University, uh, who's, who's uh, bringing up something you, you sort of uh, alluded to uh, about these sort of Hollywood representations of horses. Can you talk a bit more about the breeds and sizes of horses in the ancient world? Always interested in that, as, as am I even, so I'd like to hear the answer too. Um, so I don't like to use the term breed. Uh, breed is a very modern term. It's a very loaded term, um, and I, I tend to use types. Uh, because often when you look at, at, especially horse breeds, you know, you can look at like the, the European sport horse breeds and there's a bunch of them and they have all have their own specific registries and stud books. They really all look kind of similar to each other because they're bred to do the same job, which is, you know, jump and dressage and, and sort of the, the Olympic disciplines. Uh, so I use types. So I kind of have a Mediterranean type and, and um, sort of North African, Near Eastern, Central Asian. Uh, but yes, they are small. Uh, we are, so in the modern horse world, especially the modern kind of North American, especially the English show world, we are very sizist. We have this idea that the bigger horse is the, the better horse, um, but big horses, you know, like your Budweiser Clydesdales and stuff, they, they're very much a modern development in the last two or three hundred years because big horses are harder to maintain. They need more food. They, they break down uh, easier. Their bodies don't take as much strain. Um, so when we look at the horses of the ancient world, they are size-wise what we would classify as pony size today. So we measure a horse in hands. A uh, hand is four inches. It's basically the palm of your hand. And you measure them from, from the ground to the withers, which is the, the bump at the base of their neck. So anything 14 to 14.2 hands and under is, is in the modern vernacular classified as a pony. Most ancient horses weren't ponies, they were just small horses. Um, and that's what the environment's created. 
I mean, if you, you look at the Mediterranean world, the Near East, North Africa, even Central Asia, these are harsh environments, either hot and dry, or they get really, really cold. Uh, large horses are going to need extra food, they're going to need extra care, they don't do well there. So these are small animals that have, you know, evolved to suit that environment. Um, and I always point out too, that they didn't have stirrups. Stirrups are where you put your feet when you're riding, uh, very useful when getting on a big horse. Uh, you had to be able to jump on your horse from the ground uh, because if you fell off in battle and you had this big massive monstrosity of a horse you couldn't very well be like stop everybody i need to find a rock so i can get back on or i need my groom to give me a leg up so they were small um and uh yeah so hollywood always puts in these big horses because they look dramatic and the actors probably want to be on a big horse for an ego sake um but in reality the size of the horses you see on things like the parthenon reliefs those are accurate representations of how big or small those horses would have been. That's great. Now, I'll, I'll add a plug for your book, The Horse in the Ancient World, because I know that this is something I turned to when I was interested in this for some work about what I, I realized I errantly called horse breeds. But nonetheless, uh, horse types, uh, that the, your book, The Horse in the Ancient World, by uh, now published by Bloomsbury, is, uh, is really great for this and definitely this, the, the place to go, right, for all answers about horses. And it's also that rare, very readable academic book as well. So. You. <laughs> buy it today <laughs> so uh changing changing tack that's i'm mixing my metaphors but um we have a next our next question comes from uh des lees uh, i'm sure you've used a variety and, and style of saddles uh what is one of your favorite types of saddles and why i do love me my roman saddle uh, it's just such a cool thing to ride in. Uh, again, it doesn't have stirrups yet. So the Roman saddle is a four-horned saddle um, that does appear in, in some later Roman art. We do, there are examples, parts of them that have been found, uh, I think in, in sort of Germany and, and France that have been, Peter Connolly was really big in reconstructing them. Um, and it kind of just like, it squashes you in there. Like the horns hold you on the horse. Um, you're not going anywhere once you're in. Getting in and out is a bit of a wiggle. Um, and I love it because, you know, you can use it, you can lean against it, it, it you can jump in it, you can do all of this stuff. Um, it's what we call the earliest treed saddle, so saddle with a, a rigid internal structure to it, as opposed to, you know, Scythians use like pad saddles, which are basically just the felt pads. So I really like that saddle. Um, I also really enjoy riding in, um, uh, it's, it's a type of Spanish saddle, it's sort of the, the working, uh, the caro saddle, uh, and it's huge, but it's got this giant fluffy sheepskin on it, so it's also just really, really comfortable. Mongolian saddles, not comfortable. They are made of wood, uh, just wood, and they have these silver conchos that go where your butt cheeks would normally sit, and that's to encourage you to stand the whole time, so you're super, you don't sit down on them, you just stand. Um, after my first three days in Mongolia, I'm like, why, why does my stomach hurt so much? And it's because I was getting a six pack because you just stand for hours every day as you gallop along. So yeah, Roman saddle, uh, probably my favorite just because it's, it's the beginning of what we have today and it actually works really well. Do you have some of these saddles that you bring to, I know you do these various shows where mm. you've done kind of horse edu uh, education at equestrian fairs and like, do you have bring these when you, you do those shows? Yeah, so between uh, Radar and I, we have uh, quite a collection of uh, things and stuff that, um, I just had to buy a new car because my, my old beater, it was on its last legs and, and, you know, I can't really buy like a little tiny city car because I need something big enough to carry everything, all the armor and the saddles and, and I had to double check that my spears would fit in it. So, you know priorities. Standard question for a car salesman, I'm sure. Does a hot white spear fit in this RAV4? So. Uh, next question is from, from my colleague, Dr. Melissa Funky. Uh, she's very interested in whether bioarchaeology can give us insight into the breeds, I'm going to correct Melissa, types of horses used in antiquity. Are there any smaller types known for a calm demeanor? And she adds that her experience with Mongolian ponies is they are very stubborn. Yeah, so um, I do, I, bio, so the sort of bioarchaeology of, of horses is a growing field and there are some really cool DNA studies being done, uh, trying to track again domestication, the movement of horse types uh, across the ancient world. Where bioarchies, where bioarchaeology is really useful is again, figuring out size. Uh, and so again, the, the skeletal remains that have been found sort of date, you know, from across the ancient world are all relatively small. Um, the bioarchaeology can also tell us about the diet. Uh, so there's some really famous um, tombs from, from Siberia, the Pazric burials, that are Scythian kind of 
fourth-ish century, I think they were. Um, but everything was preserved by the permafrost. The horses that were were interred in these 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 kurgans uh, were basically mummified with their fur and everything everything still on. Uh, and it looks like there were there so there was this kind of the standard step type, but it also looks like there were some imported types from maybe further south in Central Asia. Um, and the reports I've read um, by Rudenko and, and others uh, suggest that those imported horses didn't adapt well to that environment. And you could see sort of where they, you know, their, their hooves become a bit weaker when they weren't getting the proper nutrition and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, bioarchaeology can tell us, gives a good idea about proportions and size and nutrition and injuries. I mean, just like with people, when we study human remains, um, so that's a whole new kind of venue that, I, that I'm starting to, to wander into. And I do kind of have some, some potential projects in the work working, uh, looking at that. And then yes, Mongolian ponies. So um, Xenophon talks about sort of um, gentling horses, taming horses. He's like, you know, get them to like you. Though we do get the impression that because the Greeks predominantly rode stallions, which are uncastrated males, that they were a bit bitey. Because he also talks about putting muzzles on them whenever you're leading them around so that they don't bite you or each other. Um, and often the the demeanor, so we do know that some types are calmer than others. You know, in the modern world, we say like the big draft horses, they're the biggest, they're massively huge. They tend to be quite level-headed, uh, whereas little ponies tend to be little demons in cute furry bodies. Um, but a lot of it also comes down to the husbandry. So in the case of the Mongolian horses, they are half trained at the best of times because you're a nomad and you have your herd and you might have hundreds of horses and there are some that you ride, some that you milk, some that you probably never really handle. So they don't train them in the same way that, that we do. I mean, you basically get on and just go. Um, and so they don't necessarily have that let's let's make them these calm sort of submissive horses because they don't need that i mean remember these guys are tied these guys and women i mean both genders are like tied onto these horses and learn to ride before they can walk uh and then i think you know then in more urban settings where people might have one or two horses and they they build a closer rapport with them that's obviously going to change the attitude as well so yes some types some breeds do have a reputation for being hotter and more sensitive than others um, but often it also comes down to handling and and understanding your horse your particular horse's quirks and, and idiosyncrasies but yes mongolian horses super stubborn and half wild so much fun to ride though Sort of interested. You mentioned the the Greeks generally rode stallions, and that there's a kind of I didn't know there's such a, a the, there's a big gender difference when it comes sex difference. I guess when it comes to horses, it makes me think of I guess Iliad twenty three that Menelaus's horses I think are are mares, and and Kuniska, the famous first Olympic victor, she also claims to have ridden mares. So would there have been an advantage in in sports maybe to riding mares versus stallions? So I actually have a chapter coming out on this it's in right now, but I'm happy to talk about it. I've, I've talked about it before. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's, the, of course, the famous uh, horse race from, from Patroclus' funeral games. And, uh, you know, so Menelaus is, is dry. At least one of his horses is a mare, uh, and she's really, really good. Um, and I can't, I mean, having a bit of a brain blank right here, but one of the other drivers mocks his horses because they're being beaten by a girl. Like, that's a mare. Like, you are stallions. What are you? Um, and we do know of, of, of plenty of famous mares who, who won races. I mean, Kylon, you know, allegedly run with the same team of four mares. I think three, three or four seconds, I think it was three Olympiads in a row, so over a 12-year period. Uh, there's a the the uh, Fidelis's mare Breeze who who won the Kelly's race the ridden weight race at Delphi after dumping her rider she still won because she knew how it worked of Chris Kuniska who yes you know was the first female Olympic victor um, so in the sporting side you do tend to see mares um, when you look at the military side I don't doubt that mares were ridden I'm sure they were uh, but in the art certainly you see a lot of stallions there is a famous saying, I have no idea how old it is, um, but that you uh, you talk to a stallion, you tell a gelding what to do, so they're the castrated males, and you discuss things with a mare. So mares have this reputation for being very particular. Um, they will kind of give you the middle finger if you try and make them do something they don't want to do. They, they tend to be quite uh, opinionated, um, and again, that's some anthropomorphizing, but certainly having ridden stallions, geldings, and mares, uh, there are kind of differences in how you approach them. And, and the stallions, of course, tend to be, have more muscle to them because the testosterone, so they have that bigger, prancier appearance that, that you know, Xenophon talks about and that you certainly see in, in the art. But yes, you do get the mares in racing, and that is uh, a rabbit hole that I'm, I'm definitely falling into and, and becoming very curious about. 
Okay, I look forward to the, your, your results. So <laughs> we're continuing with mayors then. Uh, my colleague, Dr. McKinnon, Michael McKinnon here at Winnipeg has a question about mayors, specifically the mayor's milk you mentioned. Was mayor's milk used in the Greek and Roman world? Can it be used to make cheese? How might that taste? I'm not sure if Michael's planning a dinner party, but uh, that, those are his questions. Um, I have not come across any references to horse milk being drunk in the Greek and Roman world. It seems to be an exclusively Central Asian thing. Yes, it is used to make cheese. Um, they, they make these, these cheese balls that if you think of the densest, heaviest, saltiest feta you've ever had, up that by about 50%. Um, and the horse milk itself, so the partner's hiding downstairs. He would he would actually probably be almost trying not to throw up right now because he had a really bad experience with it. So to me, I say that so the, the cheese tastes like a really intense feta. Uh, the horse milk tastes like sour fizzy yogurt, which sounds gross. Really isn't. I think it tastes, it's kind of like that, um, oh, it's like the probiotic fizzy milky thing that you can buy in the grid, the kefir. It's kind of like that, but with a bit of a stronger taste, also not pasteurized. Uh, Lucas, my partner, likens the horse milk to, um, if you think of the hairiest, smelliest, stiffest horse blanket you've ever seen in your life, pour room temperature milk through that into a glass and drink it. So as you can tell, he didn't do so well with the, the horse milk. But it's really good for you, super high in vitamin C. Um, but yes, um, you can make cheese out of it. You can also further distill the, the Arag, the kumis into basically moonshine, which is like 40 or 50%, uh, which apparently they, they drink in Mongolia in the winter to warm the cockles of the heart. Wow, yeah, that maybe we need that today in Winnipeg, perhaps. Um, Oh, our next question. Yes, so we're switching back to sort of mythology and, and legend from uh, our friend Maureen Babb. Have you spent much time looking at how horses are portrayed in mythology, Amazons as riders, Pegasus, etc.? And if so, how do you relate uh, those studies of mythology to the experimental riding you've done? Sure. Um, so, I mean, the Amazons, they, they are certainly something that I have some fun with. Um, I know Adrian Meyer and, and other people, you know, there's been more work done on Amazons and certainly, um, you know, they, we have, they have found Kurgans, they found burials, again, across Central Asia that seem to be females interred with riding equipment as well as weaponry. Um, and of course, the Amazon, they're, they're, you throw in the myth aspect to it. But as with all myths, you can usually pare it down to at least some sort of basis in reality. And again, when you look at the nomadic traditions of Central Asia, which is where the Amazons are you know, supposed to have come from, for a nomad family or tribe to be successful, you know, everyone has to be able to ride. Everyone has to be able to, to, to do it all. It's not necessarily a gendered thing where just the men are going out and riding and, and shooting their bows and, and hunting. You know, the, the women have to be able to do that as well. And, and certainly, in some parts of Central Asia and certainly in Mongolia, that is very much so the, the case today where girls and boys grow up riding together. You don't have that, that gender difference. In other parts of Central Asia, you are starting to see more precise gender roles coming out um, as a result of sort of different, different social and, and, and belief influences. So the idea of warrior women who are, you know, incredibly gifted riders and, and capable of fighting on horseback, within the context of a nomadic horse culture, it makes sense. Then you throw in the extra, they don't marry and they don't do this and they reject men and da 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 da, that's, that's the, I suppose, Greek fantastical component throw in, thrown in. And then Pegasus, um, you know, I think Pegasus is great. Uh, I mean, the fact that he's, you know, born from Medusa's blood and the whole Poseidon element of all of that as well, I think really ties Pegasus just kind of back into horse lore. Um, and, and I think certainly in, the, in, in, again, the Greek and Roman world, there's this, this very masculine tone to horses and what they represent and their sort of way that we do have images of women riding, but certainly it's far more of a, a masculine based thing. And, and yeah, Pegasus and the idea of the flying horse, there's um, there's a flying horse tradition that comes out of China as well. Uh, I think is it, it might be the Han Dynasty. It's really embarrassing because I have a replica of it. And, and it's basically called the flying horse. And it's this bronze of a horse and basically a flying pace, which is like it's been the gated horses do. But he's, he's standing on a sparrow. So again, this idea that horses, because they are so fast, and, and when you get that horse in a flat out gallop or a flat out pace, you, you do kind of float along. And so again, that notion of flying, you're going so much faster, and they jump, you know, instead of, we know that they trained horses to jump in the ancient world as well. So the idea that you jump over things and, and you can run so much faster, there is often this association between horses and birds and flight, and Pegasus may be some odd mashup of that as well so all right now 
Okay. Um, our next question is from a very important member of the audience, my mom, Sheila Miller. Uh, so her question is, uh, in the hierarchy of the herd, would the trainer have to assert his or her dominance? Yes. I mean, it's not in the same sense of, and I mean, even with dogs and stuff, there's more and more research being done on dominance training versus not dominance training. Um, but, you know, the, the trainer has to recognize, um, you know, if, I, if, if the trainer is working with a herd of horses, they have to recognize the, really the personalities of each horse. Um, you know, the way you approach a really dominant, almost aggressive horse is going to be quite different from how you approach a timid horse or just the middle of the road, don't really care, happy to have a job. Some horses are very work oriented, some aren't. Um, they really do have remarkable personalities. So if I'm working with a really aggressive horse, the way in which I train them and sort of reinforce commands and ideas and reward is going to be quite different from a really timid horse. And again, this is something Xenophon talks about. He talks about how to train the skittish horse he doesn't recommend getting aggressive horses for good reason. Um, so yes, the trainer, it's not even always so much asserting dominance as understanding the horse you're working with and figuring out how to push their buttons and understand their strengths and weaknesses to sort of um, set them up for, for success. I like this idea of the work-oriented horse. Yeah. <laughs> I know a few of them, they get really anxious when they're not working. Like they get super spooky and jittery because like, I have a job. I need to go herd those cows. We have one called, we have one, Peter. And uh, when he first arrived at the Jostein farm, he'd been replaced by ATVs on the feedlot. So he hadn't worked for a while and he was a bit overweight. And he was crazy. I'm like, Peter, what have you bought? Uh, but once you put him to work, he's like, brought a job. This is my job. My job is to joust apparently, but this is my job. So... Okay, wants to work, anxious when not working. These are horse academics in, in, in they are, really, yeah. <laughs> progress. Um, <clears throat> so our next uh, question from Heather Rigg. Is the small stature of horses consistent throughout the ancient world through time and location? And are these horses, excuse me, and are these horses usually gated or not? Uh, yes, so uh, small stature is pretty consistent. I mean, in terms of conformations, so that's the physical shape of the horse. Um, the overall body shape will, will shift. Uh, so, for example, one of the most famous horse types is the Nisaean horse uh, that the Persians had that comes from Media. Uh, and when you look at, you know, the Apadana reliefs and, and you, know, the, you know, Persepolis and, and you look at sort of uh, Achaemenid Persian art, you see these horses that they're just, they, look, they're, they look almost like, like bulldogs. Like they're these big, beefy, muscular animals. Even then, they're still not tall. They're just really filled out. And that's actually probably because of alfalfa. Um, alfalfa is, 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 seems to come from ancient Persia, it's what they call median grass, and alfalfa is higher in protein than other forms of grass, so you're feeding these horses get more protein, so it makes them bulkier, right? Just like, you know, power lifters eat a lot of protein and put protein powder in everything and they build up more muscle mass, that seems to be what's, what's going on um, with these Nisaean type horses. Um, but yeah, in terms of size, you're looking, you know, again, sure, Central Asian horses may be a little narrower. Um, some of the Greek horses, you know, maybe longer legs, but pretty much generally speaking, under that 14, 15 hand to 14.2 hand range. And yeah, so gated. So all horses can walk, trot, canter, and gallop, the four natural gates. Um, then you get reference to gated horses that have extra gates, a tolt, a a pace, a, a running walk, there's different versions. The thing about these gates is they're always incredibly comfortable to ride. Um, so uh, in South America, you have the Pasofino and the Peruvian Peso. They are gated, they're called the champagne horses because when they're in this gate, you can, you're supposed to be able to hold a glass of champagne and not spill it. Um, the Icelandic horse, uh, Tolts, and again, they have a contest where uh, as your horse is tolting, and it's very, very fast, you, you drink your beer uh, and don't, I don't know why alcohol is always inviolable, probably because riders are slightly crazy um, without spilling it. And so gated horses have this really unique way of moving. And we do know that there were gated horses uh, across the Mediterranean world. There still are. Uh, the Ravan races that I showed very quickly showed that picture of in Turkey. Those are gated horses. Um, I, there's a, a, a type of horse from Crete called the Yorkalidico, which means the fast walker. Uh, it's gated. It tolts like an Icelandic horse. I've ridden some. They're really cool. Um, I think it's Pliny, I can't remember if it's Pliny or Strabo, I'd have to double check, makes reference to the, the Asturian horse from, from Spain, which is a, a breed type that still exists, as being gated. Um, and so we know that there are, is sort of a string of gated horses across the Mediterranean world, often coming from mountainous environments, and that makes sense because gated horses can move on this really narrow kind of uh, 
um, weight bearing sort of surface, um, which to me, of course, when I realized this, two things, it explains the chair seat. So the chair seat is where the rider looks like they're sitting with their butt much farther back than the legs. And often with gated horses, that is the position you sit in. So again, as opposed to just going, they're wrong, they're idiots, they didn't know what they were doing. It's, well, why are they sitting like this? It could be that they're on gated horses. But I think it also kind of changes our perception of cavalry charges, because we always think of the Hollywood snorting, galloping. They could have been tolting into battle on these little, <laughs> little horses, which would have been rather different, I think. So yes, uh, consistent in being relatively small, but different body types. And yes, there were definitely gated horses. That's great. So sticking with the kind of realia, realia of ancient uh, horses, our next question is from Sophie Reika. Uh, hi, Carolyn. Good to see you again. I was wondering if you did some research on the influence on tack with horses. Did you find anything on the influence of stirrups and saddle trees in warfare? Hey, Sophie. Sophie works with tack. She, she, she makes tack. She's very, very good at it. Um, so, you know, I actually, I have become quite fond of riding bareback. Um, you, you need the right shape of horse to do it, or else it is it is very uncomfortable. Um, so when Xenophon and, and, and Vero talk about the double back, they are talking about a specific horse shape that makes riding bareback very comfortable. Um, and of course, it, so the problem with tack, especially when we talk about saddles and saddles with trees in them, is it has to fit the horse properly. Um, because if it doesn't, it's like, you know, putting on like running shoes that are too small and trying to go run a marathon, your feet are going to bleed, break, you know, issues. So, you know, when you get to tack, there is obviously more that you need to fiddle with in terms of making sure that the horse is comfortable because you don't want to cripple your horse as you ride them to war or in a competition or, and, or just, you know, sometimes they get so angry that they'll start bucking and rearing because they're in pain. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the, the stirrups and saddles, I think like I said, you can do everything bareback that you can do with a saddle and stirrups. It's just different. It's a different way of sitting the horse. It's a different way of finding your balance. So, you know, with mounted archery, the, the way I shoot my bow sitting bareback is going to be the way I use my body and the muscles is going to be different from with a saddle and stirrups because I can't stand up off the horse's back. Um, you know, the charging at the quintain with the lance, I've done that bareback. I've done that with a saddle. Again, it, it's, it's just about finding your balance. To be perfectly honest, I think um, you know, the advent of the saddle and the stirrup just made it, I don't want to say easier, but it does provide a bit more of a, a crutch. Um, you're not so reliant on that, that deep muscle memory and, and keeping that balance and having a horse with a comfortable enough shape to ride bareback. So um, I think in some ways saddles and stirrups, and I know my medievalist friends are probably yelling at me right now and say, that's not true. We definitely have lots of expert riders that are coming from, from the medieval world. Uh, and certainly when you think of like the high medieval armor, the full plate armor, that's not going to be the most comfortable thing for your horse to ride in bareback because of all of the edges and pieces. So, you know, as we get into the heavier armor and the more elaborate armor, you can see how the equipment evolves to, the, the tack evolves to match that. Um, but that's still to say that there would have been some riders out there that, that were perfectly capable of doing everything without the saddle and stirrups. So I think saddle and stirrups help sort of make it more manageable for a lot of people. Certainly it helps to allow with the, the development of, of weaponry and, and armor. Um, but I think it also then brings that, and, and you can attach more bits of armor to it for your horse. You, know, you can fully armor your horse because you can attach things to the saddle and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think it also brings the concerns of making sure that it's all fitting properly as well. But I can see a different kind of context also might call, call for different types of uh, mm. equipment even after it's been developed. Yeah, I mean, even after stirrups are invented, they aren't universally adopted. Same thing with the Roman saddle. It's not universally adopted. You still see plenty of more images where they're riding on a saddle cloth or bareback than with the saddle. So it's, it's also becomes what you know and, and what you're raised riding with. Our next question is from Hilke Hedeman. To what extent are locals you have met in touch with their own ancient history on the topic of the horse? She adds, for example, I had this fun experience where I met a guard and his horse at an Egyptian temple in the desert who told me he had the key to the temple through his family since ancient times. So I guess this comes back to the questions we sort of started our discussion with about, uh, you know, decentering yourself and, and learning from other people in, in the field work, as it were. Yeah, I mean, they, they are, they, I, pretty much everyone I've come across has been quite aware of their history and very proud of it. 
I mean, certainly in Mongolia, Genghis Khan, he is their everything. You landed the Genghis Khan International Airport. I mean, they are so proud of that. And of course, part of it is that aspect of their culture was suppressed during the Soviet period because you, they, they didn't, Soviets weren't fans of Genghis Khan. Um, and so, yeah, I think in that whole decentering idea, you know, we, we may fall into the tendency to be like, oh, you know, they haven't studied their past in school or, or they've, they've studied a, a curated version of their past, but they live their past. I mean, it's still, they're surrounded by it. You know, you tricky and then they're surrounding you. You know, I, I worked on an excavation in, in, um, in Cilicia and it's like these, you know, they are surrounded by their history, by all of it. And I think it's very foolish of us to be like, oh no, I need to explain it to you. No, they explain it to me. Like I might come in and be like, okay, well, you know, here's, you know, this is what I've come across. And, and they're always like, oh, you know, in Kyrgyzstan, like, oh, you know who Manas is. He's their national sort of folklore hero, but they know him because it's what they've been raised with. This, this is part of their identity. And so I think that's a really important reminder to like shake off our kind of academic pretensions and be like, this may not be in books. You know, there may not be academic peer reviewed articles on this, but you know it, you have these stories, you have these traditions and they're part of what has shaped who you are today so yes they, they do tend to be quite in touch with their their past especially their horse related past yeah that's a great way of putting it caroline i mean i think you're right it's this kind of imperialist and colonialist mentality that's attached itself to a lot of ac academic disciplines and maybe just the formation of academia in general unfortunately and, and it's your your evidence that once you kind of get out of that you actually start to learn more right rather than 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 privileging a certain type of knowledge. So that's yeah. great to know. Oh, I just lost my questions. All right, there, there's next question. All right, so our next question is from uh, another friend at Thornlow University, uh, Mark Sundaram. And he asks, do we know to what extent horses' skittishness has been affected by selective breeding? Are horses now, compared to ancient horses, more or less easy to spook? That is a great question, Mark. Um, so the the we know that yes i mean we we have so much specialized breeding going on now to to breed you know thoroughbred racehorses or, or show jumpers or or cutting horses things like that where you're breeding specific lines right you know this successful mare this successful stallion and breed 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 to sort of create these ultimate kind of sport horse you know animals um and so for example in sh with show jumping you know the the best show jumpers like they the horses like they they do not want they will jump out of their skin to avoid touching that rail like they they some of them get i, I know horses that they get furious like they knock and jump down and they buck and they grrr, they just throw this temper tantrum because they touched it so we do in the in the i think the sport setting um, at least in some sports breed a degree of reactivity into them and that's where we always talk about like there are amateurs horses and there are professionals horses like there are some horses that are so highly bred and talented and and, and kind of reactive because of that that it's kind of like that's maybe not a horse for like the adult amateur who rides a few days a week and you know has to drink some wine to get up the liquid courage and hey I've been there. Uh, that's the professional's horse that needs someone who rides like five, six, seven horses a day, knows this inside and out. Um, but um, the spookiness, the reactivity, it has always been there. And, you know, when I was riding in the Rockies, you know, in our backyard last summer, that wildy the, that, that I was riding, who was, who was the, the son of a, a wild stallion, um, he was very aware and uh, very, not insane, explosive reactive, but he was constantly watching. And I remember talking to, to his owner and being like, is he like really young? He's like, no, he's like 17, but that's his ancestry, right? He lived, you know, he's the descendants of, of wild horses who've been left to fend for their own and have to be hyper vigilant to avoid being eaten. And so that's still coming through. So I think the spookiness is always there because it's part of the, the evolutionary behavior but it's the ways in which we choose to direct it, right? Do we want to target it to create certain responses to make them better jumpers or faster or, or you know, whatever? Or do we want to try and, you know, again, that awareness can be really useful in battle because, you know, one thing we often don't think about is the fact that for, for a cavalryman to be successful, he did have to have some sort of relationship with his horse, understand that horse. Um, and so, you know, the horse's awareness could be useful in the battlefield because if I'm on my horse fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat with, you know, a Thracian next to me, and I don't notice that there's someone coming at me from the other side, my horse is probably going to notice that and be like, hey, hang on, let's get you out of date and let's get us out of danger. And then, you know, we'll keep going. So the reactivity isn't a bad thing, but it's something that, um, you have to be aware of when you are 
finding the suited right job for your horse and, and certainly when you're training them. Our next question is kind of continues this kind of uh, question, I guess, about the interaction between horse, the horse's sort of biological, psychological aspects and um, human training. So it's from Pia Cuneo. Are there any records written or visual of unsuccessful horse human interactions, for example, riders falling off and were there cultural or social ramifications for this lack of competency? Um, okay, so obviously, you know, one of the, I suppose most iconic examples is the story of Alexander taming Bucephalus. Um, so the, the stallion that's, that's brought for Philip, his dad to check out and the, this horse is allegedly unrideable. And it's, you know, every one of Philip's expert trainers who try to get on it, it's rearing and biting and, you know, throwing them and none of them will touch it because it's like this savage horse. And then Alexander realizes he's just afraid of his own shadow and, and off he goes. And of course it's a metaphor for him conquering this massive empire. But um, again, that's a project I'm working on. Hopefully we'll turn it into a, an article at some point, what we can read into it. Um, but, uh, and then there is um, the, 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 the account in, um, I think it's in Pisanius, uh, of, of the Phytalist who, who had a racehorse smear named Breeze um, in the, the Panhellenic Games, the Pythian Games and uh, Breeze chucked her rider in, in her jockey in the first lap of the race uh, and ran the whole thing. She knew that the trumpet sounded last lap, so she knew when to stop, she won. Um, uh, and of course we get references to charioteers being hucked out of their chariots uh, because chariot racing incredibly dangerous. Um, but I've, I've never come across uh, in, in the classical text a sort of um, rider shaming. Uh, you know, Xenophon says kind of, be aware of the type your horse you're getting. He also says, don't try and cha train it yourself. Like, hey, send it to an expert. They know what you're doing. You can afford it. Have someone who knows what, what they're doing train it. I was at a, 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 a Zoom conference at the end of uh, August that a colleague in, in Latvia uh, hosted. And I, I recall there was someone talking about um, the medieval world. And yeah, kind of references to aristocrats who have to be seen on horseback because that's part of their status, but you know, they don't really practice very much. So there's kind of this, this lack of ability and they're kind of got to get them like that nice safe horse and the tack helps keep them up there. Um, so certainly there, as we move through the periods, you kind of get these underlying references to, to not being able to ride. Um, but I've not come across yet any particular rider shaming um, for, for falling off or lack of competency. You know, Xenophon talks, but again, you, you need to give them incentives to practice. Um, and I think, again, with sports, uh, especially things like the Roman Hippica Gymnasia, that's probably where a lot of this is coming from, is to make sure they're practicing so that they don't fall off when, when they go to war. But I think it was such a part of their daily life um, that, you know, varying degrees of competence, competency would, would be there. But if anyone knows of a, a, a rider shaming uh, reference, please feel free to share it. <laughs> Maybe a, a quick question then that, that comes from Patty Rose is asking uh, just if you could tell us which Xenophon book are you uh, this, that discusses mm -hmm. the horse training so we can. So Xenophon, uh, he has two horsey texts. The very famous one is his Perhippicus, his On the Art of Horsemanship. If uh, if you're a horse person and you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, I mean, there are obviously some things that have shifted between the fourth century BC and the 21st century. Uh, I, I know when I was growing up, it was, um, I'm pretty sure the text was considered uh, required reading for the British Horse Society exams, um, because there is actually so much that Zenavon talks about that has kind of carried on into the modern world. So yes, The Art of Horsemanship, um, and you can get it, I have I have it in most translations. Um, I like the Loeb, the Loeb Classical Library, his Scripta Minora. Uh, it also has, this version also has his other horse text, which is on the Cavalry Commander, which is basically, there's some repetition, but it's how it talks about drills and exercises and, and, and stuff like that, so. Our next question, uh, questioner wants to move uh, to other equids, I guess, from Carla Manfredi in the Department of English here at Winnipeg. Were donkeys and mules present in the ancient world? And I guess briefly, what was their role? Yes. So um, I teach some, I teach classes on sort of perception, cultural perceptions of animals. Uh, it's one of the genetic classes I teach. And I always, I mean, the poor donkey. Uh, don so I love horses dearly. Out of the trio of donkeys, mules, and horses, horses are the most impractical. All right, um, they, they have touchy digestive systems. They can be quite fragile in terms of, you know, injuries, leg injuries, things like that. Uh, in the ancient world, as I said, we weren't using them for agriculture. Their primary roles were, you know, processions, pomp, procession, entertainment, warfare, um, and, and, trans and sort of 
high-speed transportation for, for elites. Donkeys built everything. Um, there's actually a really good book by Oxford uh, that I quite love because it's given the donkey its day in the sun, which it needs. Uh, so it's Peter Mitchell's The Donkey in Human History. Really, really good. Um, it looks particularly from an archaeological perspective, but basically shows that, uh, and this is, I mean, if I had come out to, to, to uh, Winnipeg, if it wasn't COVID, I was going to actually talk about this in a different talk, um, talks about how are the perception of the donkey that we get from the classical world, because if you read Aesop's fables, donkeys are always being beaten and, and things like that. Uh, it's a reflection of uh, social snobbery, because of course, who writes the sources, the people who own horses. Uh, who has donkeys, you know, everybody else. So the image we get of donkeys in the sources isn't actually really a reflection of how important they were. They were really, really important. And then mules, so mules are cross between um, a male donkey and a female horse. If you flip it around and it's a female donkey, male horse, it's a hinny, and they apparently aren't as great as mules. Uh, mules, again, um, they are, of, of the three, probably the strongest and the smartest. They are also can be notoriously difficult to work with if you, you can't train a mule like a horse. So the Romans become very famous for their mules. Mules were essential to the Roman army, especially from sort of Marius onwards. Uh, we hear about, you know, Marius' soldiers being referred to as Marius' mules because they have to carry some of their own stuff. Uh, and there was a particular region of Italy that was famous for its mules. The problem with mules is that they're sterile. So mules, you can't breed a mule to a mule. Um, you have to have that horse-donkey combination. So uh, again, mules, and there are some... Uh, in North America, uh, especially down in like the Baja Peninsula, a lot of the vaqueros down there will ride mules instead of horses to do their ranch work because again, they're so sure-footed, so working through the, the steep terrain um, and they are, they're pretty badass. They are very territorial. Uh, they kind of, donkeys as well, uh, a lot of ranchers will keep donkeys as guard animals uh, because a donkey will bray its head off um, if it senses danger, it will also kick the crap out of like a cougar or a wolf or, or whatever. Um, mighty, mighty donkeys. So yes, donkeys and mules, incredibly important. Um, we just don't see them as much in the art and the literature um, because, uh, because of social snobberies. And of course, we have that sort of short-lived mule cart race at Olympia, right? That's yes, the short-lived mule cart race. But, uh, I mean, I feel like that would have been that would have been quite entertaining to watch. Because, yeah, and, and um, so there's actually, uh, falling down a bit of a rabbit hole, um, there has been, so we have these sort of different national federations for horse shows. Uh, so if, a few years ago in Britain, there is a, a, a dressage mule, so dressage is like the English flat riding type of stuff, uh, named Wallace the Great, a rescue mule. I think he was found wandering around a village in Scotland. Um, but his, his, the, the woman who adopted him from the rescue agency was a, a dressage rider and her horse went lame before a show. So she, she showed Wallace and then she wanted to show him in the national level competitions. Uh, and British dressage said, no, it has to, that, it has to be a, a horse with two horse parents. And so there was, it, the BBC got onto this, like it was this huge thing of like this almost uh, a species racism, speciesism against mules. And the same things happened in North America. Uh, there's a woman down in Colorado who has this adorable, mule named uh, Mueller, and she got the U.S. Hunter Jumper Association to change its rules to allow mules to show in their competitions as well. So again, this this has kind of carried on into the, to the present world. So we're, yeah. All right, well, it's, it's 420, so we've entered the kind of lightning round here, and I, right. I think I see four okay. questions remaining, so we're going to try and squeeze them all in, so this, maybe the answers will maybe be shorter, but we'll get to everyone's question. Right. How about that? So our first one is from uh, Flavia Amaral at the University of Toronto. We know from epigrams that queens were celebrated as horse race winners. We refer to this, of course. However, we also know that they wouldn't have ridden the horses themselves. Have you encountered references to women riding horses in the ancient world? Yes, uh, and this is another project that I'm working on. Uh, Macedonia, um, so there are references to, uh, uh, I, have, I haven't looked at them in a while, but uh, to Macedonian royal women riding horses. Um, and as I said, we do have images of riding horses, women riding horses, uh, and not just in the Amazon context. So, and, and there's also uh, references from Sparta of women, maybe not so much riding, but driving chariots in the Hyacinthia festival. So yes, there is, tantalizing hints of evidence for women in the Greek world uh, and, and, and probably the Roman world as well, riding or driving, um, but uh, you have to dig for it a little bit. And I'm, I'm working on doing that. 
I'm losing track. I think that's three forthcoming publications of yours that we're all going to have to, to look I up. To... I don't believe in taking time off, apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, next in our lightning round from uh, my colleague here at Winnipeg, Chris Lawfeed. How much time does an average horse need to spend grazing to feed itself mm -hmm. that way? And was this a factor in military campaigns? So horses are designed to graze for something like 12 to 14 hours a day. That is how their digestive systems are designed. Um, obviously on military campaigns, that's not possible. Also with the way we stable most horses today, uh, which has actually led to ulcers becoming a huge issue in, in stabled horses um, when you feed them at certain times because their guts aren't designed to process food that way. So in a natural setting, horses will graze for most of their waking hours. Um, obviously on military campaign, that's not possible. Uh, and so they would have been supplementing their horses with hard feed. So grain, oats, things like that. Probably, yes, letting them graze when they can. Uh, what uh, they certainly wouldn't have had the, the, the space uh, or the, 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 the time to let them graze uh, naturally. So they would have had to supplement the diet. Right, okay. And now finally, we've got a couple repeat questioners. So I apologize for leaving you to the end. Uh, Maureen Babb, uh, again, our colleague here at the University of Manitoba, uh, perhaps an unpleasant question for a horse person, but how common was horse sacrifice in the ancient world? Was it common, a special sort? How did it vary between cultures? Uh, so in uh, Indo-European traditions, horse sacrifice is a big thing. Um, you find it in India, Celtic cultures, uh, certainly across um, Central Asia as well. Uh, so sometimes the horse sacrifice is connected to rituals in terms of like kingship and power and authority, um, certainly in Central Asia. And we do have some examples from, from Greece and Rome as well, horses being sacrificed as parts of burials. Um, and, and this is really quite common in Central Asia. Uh, I think that there's, there's one uh, Kurgan burial that I think had some being like this was obviously a really important chief dinner individual I think a hundred horses interred with them um so I th we think in the nomadic tradition it's the idea of you know bringing your favorite horses with you to the afterlife or something like that so that you can keep riding them or no one else is going to ride them so yes uh horse and there's a, a volume that's come out on um from uh, uh I think it was published by an archaeological um, press in uh, Sweden, I have a copy of it somewhere, um, looking at the Indo-European horse sacrifice tradition. So it is it is quite common. Uh, and then there's the October horse race um, from the Roman tradition as well, which is kind of going back to myth where, uh, and it was like an annual thing. And I think it was the winning horse was, was, was sacrificed um, as part of a, a tradition, probably going back to almost even pre-Republican times, early Republican or pre-Republican times. So yes, horse sacrifice is a thing. Okay, and our, our final question, uh, back to our friend Avon McMaster from Thornlow. Uh, a follow-up to the question asked you earlier about the absence of horses. Uh, the absence on horses in Ithaca is noted specifically in the Odyssey. We're ending with a classical literature question. Do you have any thoughts about the significance of the absence of horses? Yeah, I find the island thing really interesting. Um, so, I mean, Ithaca obviously is, is very small and very rocky, um, not a great place to keep horses. Most of Greece isn't a great place to keep horses. So I, I think when you look to, to islands, um, it's also that that lack of um, uh, suitable space for hippotrophia. You would have to import a lot, um, which, you know, I've, I've long been fascinated with Cyprus because there is such an, a long and early horse tradition on Cyprus. I mean, they're everywhere in, in sort of early Cypriot art. Um, and I sort of actually have a story that, that ties into this. So when I was riding on Crete, uh, and this was back in like 2008, I think. Um, so uh, the, the stables were run by um, a, a local, a Greek, uh, Cretan and, and his, his Dutch wife. Uh, and they were saying that they basically had to import absolutely everything, all of their tack, all of their feed, everything had to be imported from uh, either mainland Greece or other parts of Europe, which I think speaks to, of course, the isolation of the islands. And if you don't have like an island like Sicily, where sure you've got tons of grassy plains, but if you're kind of on your standard Greek island, which is mostly mountainous, uh, it becomes very, almost prohibitively expensive to try and raise horses there, so. Great, Carolyn, you've won, you've won the lightning round. That's the end of our questions, and we're just about at the end of our time for our talk. So before um, we sign off, I'd just like to uh, remind the audience members that this is the third in our series of five uh, New Directions in Classics talks this year. Our next talk is March 5th, when Dr. Jessica Romney from McEwen University will come and give a talk entitled Wine, Song, and Self. Uh, looking at uh, the sympotic culture and, and symposium in ancient Greece based on her uh, book recently published by the University of Michigan Press. Uh, we have a further talk on March 26th with our own Dr. Michael McKinnon. And you can find the titles of these talks, uh, posters when they're available, and most importantly, Zoom registration links uh, on our website, uwinnipeg.ca slash classics. 
Uh, if you're on Twitter or Facebook, you can like our department accounts there and follow uh, and, and find the uh, information when it becomes available. Uh, today's talk has been recorded, so if you want to relive uh, or revisit some of the questions that Carolyn answered, or if you know someone who would be interested and couldn't make it today, it'll be on our YouTube page. It's, the YouTube link is horrendously impossible to remember, so it's easiest just to go to uwinnipeg.ca slash classics and get to it through the New Directions and Classics link on the left-hand side of the page. With that, it just remains for me to thank profusely Dr. Carolyn Willekes for coming virtually today. Uh, we hope to have you in Winnipeg proper one day in the near future, but this talk, uh, I think, demonstrated to us not only your wide-ranging knowledge of all things equestrian, but also the, valuable, the value of kind of getting out of the academy, which our series is all about, getting into the real world and learning from people, uh, not only from books. So thanks very much, Carolyn, for coming and for giving uh, your time to answer so many questions. Uh, and uh, thank you to the audience members for coming as well. We hope we'll see you all on March 5th. Bye. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.